Leica Studios, famously known for their stop-motion animated movies such as Box Trolls, Paranorman, and what I consider to be the best animated movie of all time, Coraline. But Leica Studios has a movie that is a bit overlooked by a lot of people. And where I do still consider Coraline to be the best stop-motion animated movie of all time, I cannot deny that Kubo and the Two Strings has the most complex and beautiful stop-motion animation out of any movie ever made. Holding the record for the biggest stop-motion puppet used in a stop motion movie standing at a ridiculous 16 feet but not only that they had the second largest stop motion animated puppet at 11 feet not to mention they used over a hundred thousand real leaves to make an actual boat and they even used a combination of practical effects with CG to create an ocean that looks somewhat like stop motion. The amount of detail and the crazy lengths they go to to make this movie this beautiful is insane. And there isn't really a lot of action in this movie, but the choreography between Monkey and the sister is some of the cleanest fighting I've seen out of stop motion. This movie actually did worse than any Leica film Ever. It flopped so hard and I don't know why. It could have been the promotion or it could have been something else but from what I've seen it kind of is just people just not caring about the movie and I'm here to tell you right now you need to watch Kubo and the Two Strings. Now we talked about the visuals let's talk about the story a little bit. This is where a lot of people are kind of mixed reviews on is the story. Now me personally I love the story. Now sure I don't think it's as good as Coraline but the story is very good. A lot of the reason that people don't like the story has to do with the ending of it. It's one of those situations where you love it or hate it because the ending can leave a lot of people feeling like, oh, the entire point of the movie was completely worthless and it didn't even matter. But I feel like the reason people feel like that is because they don't actually understand why the ending was what it was. If you look at it on the surface, sure, it kind of looks like the whole movie was pointless and, you know, there's no reason for what happened. But if you really look at it for what it is, it makes a lot of sense why the movie ended how it did. And another thing, there are only a handful of movies that have ever gotten me to tear up and boy did this movie do it for me. Now that also could be a part of the fact, you know, I am a dad, you know, I have a son, so I can relate to that father-son bond a lot more than most people. But the story in this movie is extremely engaging. It grabs you right from the beginning and it keeps you entertained throughout. There's rarely a dull moment. Now I will admit there is one gripe I have with the story and we we'll get to that part uh, later on in the video. And I'm pretty sure a lot of people probably have the same gripe, but it made me a little bit angry. But fair warning, I'm going through this whole movie. So obviously, spoilers. If you haven't seen Kubo and the Two Strings, I would highly recommend that you go watch it right now. Pause the video, go watch the movie with a couple friends, come back and, 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 you know, and then you'll know what's going on. Pick, pick, oh, oh, you won't believe this man. Balenciaga has a Fortnite collection and they got a jean jacket. Can you please get me one? Balenciaga Fortnite collection? What the hell are you talking about? Oh my God, $1,200 for a jean jacket with Fortnite on the back? Are you insane? What do you mean it's collector's edition? Of course it's gonna be $1,200. Come on, man, I look great in denim. I look amazing in we denim. We can literally just get a regular jean jacket and put Fortnite on the back. For like 50 bucks, it's maybe. It's not the same, man. You know that. Come fine, on. Fine, fine. Let me just see if Honey has any deals. Honey? What's that? Was that good? I mean, it was a little bit over the top. A bit but too much. You know, it, right. Sorry. you got the right idea. Honey is the number one shopping tool in America and something I find myself using all the time. It automatically searches for promo codes so you don't have to go searching for anything like that and it gives you the best deals by the click of a button. And this works on so many different things that you already buy today. Seriously, you would be amazed by seeing how much money you could already be saving by using Honey. And not exaggerating, I've been using Honey for years before they ever decided to sponsor me. Thank you so much, Honey. Why don't you try it out for yourself? Go to joinhoney.com slash bionic pig go download the app go see what deals you can get you would be surprised seriously do it now
So the movie starts out with a woman seeming like she is trying to run away from something. And it's as if the ocean itself is trying to stop her. And she gives her Japanese loot, or shimasen, I will be probably referring to it as that most of the time, a big ass slap and the wave just splits in half. God, it looks so good. But she ended up getting surprised and swept by another wave, goes down and hits the sea bottom with her face. And this is where we meet Kubo, who has an eye, who apparently has been stolen by his grandfather, or at least that's what the narrator is saying. So yeah, already the opening has me confused and hooked instantly. So we skip to the future and see Kubo as a young kid, picking up a bunch of paper on the floor meticulously. And we see a look in his face like this is a pretty common occurrence. So we get an amazing transition to a boiling pot of water and he ends up making some rice and sets it on the ground. And this is where we see his mother, who seems to be completely unresponsive in some sort of trance. Kubo even has to feed her rice because she just isn't moving at all. So it seems that she is suffering from some sort of brain trauma when she hit that rock. A bell starts ringing and Kubo grabs the Seamuson and his wooden monkey gives his mom a sad look and heads off to this cute little town. And on his way to this small village, there is just an amazingly beautiful shot of the mountain that he lives on and golden grass of an open field. It just looks so freaking good. It's hard to believe this stuff is stop motion. So we get to this small town bursting with life and meet this old lady who seems to be Kubo's friend. And we find out that Kubo is a street performer in this town and is a very popular one at that. And the reason he's popular is because he could literally use magic to take pieces of paper and fold them in an origami fashion and make an entire story out of it. And this story includes the great hero Hanzo, whose army was destroyed by the Moon King. So Hanzo tries to find these three different pieces of ancient armor, which is apparently the only way to defeat the Moon King. And just a small detail I want to mention in this portion of the movie not only is like the origami fighting and all that different stuff in stop motion insane but the fact that they even match his finger movements on the shamisen are extremely accurate like every hammer on every pull off every strum it's so perfectly done like the amount of detail that goes into it and right before he gets to the end of the story with the fight between hanzo and the moon lord the bell tolls and he stops doing his thing and heads back up to his mom. And apparently this is a common thing for Kubo's stories. They never have an ending. Even one of the audience members says, you know, people like an ending. Why aren't you ever gonna give us an ending? So Kubo goes back to his mom and it seems like his mom kind of just snaps out of her trance randomly now that it's night, which is an important detail we'll get to later. And she tells these stories to Kubo about the Moon King and Hanzo. So it seems all the stories that Kubo is telling the townsfolk are actually just stories that his mom tells him at night. And we also find out that Hanzo in these stories is actually supposed to be Kubo's father. And also, Kubo's grandfather and his mom's sister are both searching for him to take his eye. And apparently the only way he's safe is to make sure that he is back home at night. And in Kubo's perspective, obviously, he's kind of confused about the whole thing. All his mom really tells him is that people are after him, get back here before nightfall, and that's kind of it. But there are a couple things after watching this movie several times that I realized I missed. Like the fact that his mother tells Kubo to always keep the wooden monkey on him at all times, and also always wear his father's robe no matter what happens and it's interesting because even when his mom tells these stories she even forgets stuff while she's telling the story so we could plainly see that his mom definitely is suffering from some sort of brain trauma and then all of a sudden like clockwork she just falls straight back into her trance and falls to sleep man maybe she wouldn't be having all these problems if she drank a little bit of g fuel am i right <laughs> g fuel does not cure any sort of head trauma please use code pig to get 30 percent off your order i'm so sorry and this is where we find find out why Kubo was picking up paper the night before. It seems like his mother has nightmares and papers kind of just fly around. Something that must happen pretty often just by how we see Kubo's face. And there's something I find really interesting. So his mom has powers just like Kubo, but she is gradually losing her mind. So I think she uses these powers in order to put herself in this sort of trance state during the day and then wakes up at night to use the most out of her brain to keep Kubo safe. Almost like she's kind of saving her brain energy in order to make sure Kubo's safe at night. So anyway, we skip to the next day and see that the townspeople are throwing a festival to celebrate the dead and speak to those who have passed. And so the old lady mentions to Kubo that he should do it as well, you know, so he could speak to his father who he assumes is dead. So Kubo makes a little paper lantern and attempts to do it. And it seems like everyone else is talking to their loved ones and sending them off on their way. But Kubo can't get his lantern to light. So Kubo, assuming that his dad just doesn't want to talk to him, gets really fed up with it, crunkles up crunkles 
crunkle. Crunkle, that, that's a word, crunkle. Crinkles up his bag and just throws it on the ground. And I'm an idiot and I miss this detail when I watched this movie when it came out. But this implies that his dad might not be dead. But unfortunately, since Kubo was doing this, he kind of wasted a lot of time and stayed after dark, didn't realize it. And two shadowy figures appear whispering his name. It's, it's kind, of, kind of creepy, not gonna lie. Also a little detail that's pretty cool is the fact that the moonlight is shining directly on Kubo. Almost like it's a spotlight in a way. Because we sort of get the idea by now that his grandfather is the Moon King and we're assuming that the Moon King, you know, controls the moon at night. So these two dark figures are actually Kubo's aunts, the sisters who are trying to take his other eye. So he runs into town and asks for people to help. And no joke, when I saw this, I assumed, oh, you know, the town's going to be fine. Kubo's going to run into town, turn around, and then they're going to disappear. And then it's going to, everyone's going to be like, wow, this kid's crazy. But I was so surprised and thrown off when the town literally just gets enveloped in this like magic darkness and just gets destroyed. I guess my brain is just used to that trope happening, but no. The movie's just like, fuck it, destroy the entire town. And like a badass, Kubo's mom appears. She tells Kubo that he needs to find the armor and touches the back of his father's robe, which turns into wings. And he ends up flying away. And when he was flying away, he ended up accidentally ripping off a piece of his mom's hair, which is important. And so she's left to fight her sisters alone, assuming that she didn't make it. Can you hear me, Kubo? <gasps> I said your mother is gone. Your village is destroyed, burned to the ground. We landed here in the Far Lands. Your enemies aren't far behind. We must search for shelter before your grandfather comes. We need to go now. Monkey. Waking up to a talking monkey telling you your mom is gone and your town is destroyed. Now that's what I call my Saturday night. <laughs> So the dialogue and like back and forth between the monkey and Kubo is honestly one of the best natural comedy I've seen in a, in a movie. Because at the end of the day, Kubo is still a kid and acts as such. The movie didn't kind of thrust him into maturity like most do. So they set up camp in a whale carcass. Keep in mind, my sense of smell is 10 times stronger than yours. Uh-oh, stinky. So we learn that the monkey was actually the wooden monkey charm that his mom told him to keep with him at all times. And Kubo's mother used the last of her magic to make Kubo fly away and resurrect the monkey. I don't understand what's happening. Who are you? You don't recognize me. And the monkey seems to be very real and just upfront with Kubo. I'm here to protect you, Kubo. And that means you have to do as I say. So if you don't eat, you'll be weak. If you're weak, you'll be slow. If you're slow, you'll die. <laughs> What you know about- So Monkey wakes up Kubo to find his Hanzo Origami kind of taking on a life of his own. He's been standing there for hours, quietly judging us. So the Origami Hanzo ends up leading them towards what they think is going to be a piece of the armor. And on the way there, Kubo kind of plays around with his paper and Monkey mentions that Kubo is getting stronger. Now this is very important. This is the stuff that people kind of looked over when it had to do with the ending. So remember this part. Tread carefully, Kubo. This isn't one of your stories. How do you know? Maybe it is. And I'm the valiant hero, and you're the mean monkey. Heroes come and go. Any moment, something terrible could come out of nowhere, and... <laughs> So Kubo gets yoinked by a giant beetle man who has amnesia. And apparently the only thing he can remember is the stuff he has with them. And he has a beetle crest, which is also on the back of Kubo. And he also can remember that he was actually a disciple of Hanzo and Hanzo was actually his master and that he believes he used to be a samurai. And apparently he was cursed to be in this beetle form. And again, I know I've said this a lot, but after watching this a second time, if you look at his belongings, if you look at what he has behind him, if you look at his armor, you can could already kind of start piecing together who this actually is pretty quick. So reluctantly, Monkey agrees that he can join the party and help find the armor. So they end up finding the entrance to the Sword Unbreakable. He did it. And this is where we get to see the 16 foot tall puppet 
skeleton. And boy, I can see how the height of the skeleton really paid off. Because that looks ominous as shit. So they all end up almost dying in the process. But Beetle Man apparently can fly. He just figured that out. So they make their way out with the sword unbreakable. And this part of the movie is very important and very telling of what actually is going on. It's just one of those things that you might miss your first watch through. Monkey and Beetle start getting in an argument and Kubo complains about them fighting again. And they're complaining about whether or not to cross the long lake or walk around it. So we have a man, a woman, complaining about directions while a young kid seems annoyed about them arguing again. Hmm. Hmm. Seems a bit suspicious, some sussy stuff going on here. So Kubo once again surprises them with his powers and makes an entire boat out of leaves. Yes, the boat, which again was literally made with over 100,000 real leaves. That is insane. Another example of Kubo's powers getting stronger. So on the way to find the armor, they have some time to kind of relax and enjoy each other's company. Beetle teaches Kubo how to shoot a bow and they have a little bit of a dinner together. And Kubo mentions that he's never once had dinner in between two people. And we can even start to see Monkey and Beetle kind of having some flirtatious, interesting stuff going on. So they all start really enjoying each other's company and really, you know, feeling like a group. And boy, does that make it a lot more depressing once we figure out who they actually are. So apparently the armor is in the Garden of Eyes. So Beetle goes in by himself because apparently these eyes, if you look into them, they show you secrets of your soul and they keep you down there and you would die. So a lot of time passes and Kubo obviously gets pretty concerned. So he jumps in after him. And as Monkey goes in to help, boom, one of the sisters arrive to stop her. And all the while they start fighting fighting, Kubo ends up finding the armor, but ends up getting caught by the Garden of Eyes, which I just want to mention is the second largest stop motion puppet standing at a rousing 11 foot. Mmm, and god damn it, it looks so cool. And what comes next is one of the coolest stop motion fights I've seen between Monkey and one of the sisters. And throughout this beautiful fight, the sister kind of starts wallowing about the loss of her sister and how her sister ended up leaving their family for a disgusting human man. And she mentions that made her sister weak. And then Monkey says one of the coolest lines in the movie, and it gave me chills then and it still gives me chills now. And love made her weak. No. <laughs> It made me stronger. Because not only does that reveal the fact that Monkey is actually mommy, but when she said falling in love and having a family made her stronger is so integral to the end of the movie. So she ends up slicing her sister's face in half. Mm. And as it just so happens, when Kubo was in the Garden of Eyes, he ended up seeing the secret of Monkey, who is actually his mom. So Beetle ends up saving Kubo and bringing him back, and Kubo's mom ends up telling the story to both of them. She apparently is the daughter of the Moon Lord, who is sent to kill Hanzo because Hanzo was searching for the three pieces of armor and the Moon Lord believed that if you find those three pieces of armor, then he would be a threat to the heavens. So she fought Hanzo and during the fight, he kind of stopped, looked in her eyes and said four words. I love you. Monkey? And those four words are, you are my quest. He realized that this whole time he was searching for this armor, believing that that was supposed to be his quest until he found her. Realizing that it wasn't his destiny to find the armor, it was his destiny to find her. That was the whole point of his quest. Which again, is integral to the ending of the movie. So after the Moon Lord found out about them, he came and stole one of Kubo's eyes. Then Hanzo and his army did everything he could to let Kubo and his mom escape. That was the whole beginning of the movie. And the reason he wants Kubo's eyes is so Kubo can be blind to humanity, just like the Moon Lord is and just like the sisters are because they believe that humanity is weakness and they believe if they take away their sight, they can't look into their eyes and see their soul, you know, and see their humanity. And this is where shit goes bad. Kubo ends up having a dream with his grandfather, the Moon Lord, which Kubo is not aware of at the time. He tells Kubo that the helmet is at Hanzo's fortress, but you know, it, it's obviously a trap. So Kubo tells Monkey and the Beetle and them none the wiser just end up following him. And on the way, Kubo's mom starts talking about death and how death isn't really an end, but it's kind of more of a shift to a different state. Hmm. 
a little bit of foreshadowing, I guess we could say. So they get to Hansa's fortress and we see a mural on the wall of Kubo's mother and father. And whoopsie daisy, it looks like it was a trap. One of the sisters comes out of nowhere. And here it is, baby. This is where, this is where I complain. I'm about to complain about the, the story a little bit right here. So the sister ends up revealing to Kubo and his mom that the beetle is actually Hanzo. And they ended up cursing him and changing him into a beetle and made him lose his memories. Basically just to make him suffer. So this whole time they were doing this quest. So this whole time they were not aware at all that they actually were together as a family. So anyway, they get into a scuffle with the sister and Kubo's mom was injured from the last fight. So she gets knocked down pretty quick and Hanzo ends up coming in to save her. And Mad Pig's about to come out. Oh, Mad Pig's about to come out. So here we have a very touching moment. They all are finally together as a family. They all realize who all of them are and they are finally together. Just the idea that even though Hanzo had no memory whatsoever and Kubo's mom had no idea who Beetle was, they still were gradually starting to fall in love all over again, showing that their destiny was each other, their quest was each other. And Kubo was treating them both like they were parents before he even knew it. And then Hanzo says those four words that you are my quest and that he will make sure to protect Kubo. And then he just dies. Yep, just boom, one stab to the back, boom, bam, he's dead. He's a samurai. You know, he's supposed to be one of the strongest warriors on earth in this movie just straight up just like boom one shot you're dead now don't get me wrong i do feel like it was kind of necessary for this to happen but at least have him fight you know at least have him do some samurai shit he, he didn't do anything all movie but you're just gonna stab him in the back and that's it are you serious oh i'm sorry oh I, i'm sorry i'm stressed but yes that's my one complaint about this movie is his just random ass death so anyway, Kubo grabs his shamisen and breaks all of the strings. And apparently with that power, he literally ends up killing the sister, showing that he has gotten very strong throughout this quest of finding all the armor. He has gotten insanely strong, but unfortunately his mom's magic seemed to have ran out and she ends up disappearing. So yeah, both parents are dead. That's kind of sad. So Kubo ends up flying back to his village, pretty pissed off and finds that the helmet was actually hanging in the village the whole time. So he ends up getting all three pieces to this ancient armor and then the moon Lord appears. And this is also very interesting. So before Kubo flies back to the village, his mom tells him fly home. And the moon Lord even says, your mom had a reason to live here. So that implies that Kubo's mother it was completely aware the whole time that the helmet was in the village. Which again, I want to mention, that is important for what the ending is. They could have easily just went straight back to the village. Kubo's mom was completely aware of, of what was happening. Because the whole time, Kubo's mom realized she was eventually going to run out of magic and die. Because in her monkey form, it was just magic. It wasn't her. So that was inevitable. She was just going to die. And that's why she hid the fact that she was monkey from Kubo this whole time. Because she did didn't want him to know that she was going to end up perishing and then he would be sad. So she put on a different persona to try to convince him that she wasn't his mom. So the Moon Lord kind of gives this villain monologue about how, you know, humanity has suffering, pain, and death, and things that he doesn't want Kubo to see. That's why he looks down on humanity is because, you know, he doesn't like the idea of all this pain and suffering. So he believes his immortality and his omnipotence is better than being a human. And he wants to bring Kubo with them because he doesn't want Kubo to suffer the pain of humanity. So right before they start fighting, the Moon Lord asks, how does this story end? And Kubo, with a very shaky voice, says, I'll kill you. Which the direction of this was so well done because the shakiness of his voice implies that he doesn't really want to kill him. He really doesn't want to kill anyone. I mean, sure, the sister is a different story because he was enraged. But in this situation, he really doesn't want to kill. And then the Moon Lord literally walks up to the Sword Unbreakable, the three pieces of ancient armor that were supposed to shake the heavens and defeat the Moon Lord, and just walks up to the sharp end to it and pushes Kubo back, implying that this weapon has literally nothing. It has no chance of beating him. So the Moon Lord transforms into this giant snake demon creature, which is his real form. And Kubo gives some slicing and dicing to him, you know, just, just some cuts. But we start to see that these cuts don't do anything. All that it does is just kind of shine moonlight, you know, like it, it, there's no damage really being done at all. So Kubo ends up getting knocked into the cemetery, you know, where all of this kind of started happening. And he reaches for the sword unbreakable and sees the two strings, uh, two strings on his arm. One is his mother's hair and one is the bowstring that 
you know, Hanzo used. So he ends up stringing his shamisen with the hair and the bowstring and a piece of his own hair. So putting his entire family into the shamisen. So Kubo decides instead of attacking, he's going to defend. Apparently all of the townspeople were hiding in the woods from, you know, the sisters and whatever else was happening in the town afterwards. So he uses his powers, which are extremely strong now, mind you, instead of killing the moon lord he ends up blessing the moon lord with an eye himself and washing his memory because the moon lord was never able to see anything he never could see the soul of humanity but that's why he always hated humanity in a way you could kind of believe that he might have been a little bit envious of them which is why he hated them so much but after he's given the eye and sent back into a human form all of the people tell him that he is a good man you know filling his head with these memories you know that aren't real just to kind of give him a clean slate and make him believe that he's a good person and make him start over. And the very end of the movie, which, you know, a lot of people hate, is Kubo putting two lanterns on the stone from the beginning of the movie. And this time, both his mother and his father appear next to him, and then that's how the movie ends. Which, how this movie is, and how this movie is set up, death isn't necessarily losing someone, isn't necessarily completely dying, you know? It's shifting into a different form. In this movie, in this universe, you could talk to people even after they're dead. So in a way, this is technically a happy ending. But let's talk about the end for a second. Why do people hate it? The reason everyone hates the ending is because he gets all three pieces of armor. That was the whole quest of the movie, is to get this armor. But he ends up not even using it. He literally ends up throwing it to the side. It didn't do anything to the Moon Lord. And he ends up choosing a pacifist way to fight the moon lord instead so let's go over why this actually is supposed to happen why this actually is a good ending so let's lean on the fact that remember hanzo when he said you are my quest he realized that searching for the armor wasn't really the quest searching for the armor was to find kubo's mom it wasn't necessarily to get the armor and kubo's quest even his mom mentioned it throughout the whole time that he kept getting stronger. He was getting stronger and stronger, and she kept saying that that's good. Like, she wants that to happen. So the quest for the armor wasn't in order to get the armor. It was in order for Kubo to manifest his powers and get stronger in order to fight the Moon Lord. I mean, at the very end, we literally saw that Kubo's mom knew exactly where the third piece of the armor was, but she didn't tell him because she didn't believe that he was ready yet. She didn't believe that he was strong enough. But at the very end, when Kubo defeated the sister, she tells him to go back home because she believed that he's ready to fight the Moon Lord. And he had to figure out himself that it wasn't the armor that he was looking for the whole time. His quest was to manifest his own powers and use the sacrifice that his parents made in order to save the Moon Lord and stop his reign from, you know, killing people, basically. Showing the Moon Lord that humanity is actually good. And again, I completely understand why people don't like this ending. Because if you look at it on the surface if you don't look at all the small details you're just gonna be like oh yeah they got all that armor for nothing what was the point of all that so i completely get that but if you really look at this and really look at the small details in the story it's important that this happens so thank you everyone for watching this video i hope you enjoyed it and if you happen to watch this whole video and didn't watch the movie go watch the movie it's a movie i feel like everyone needs to witness it's so beautiful it's such a it's honestly the most beautiful stop animation movie you could find but if you like this video please subscribe to me if you want to go watch me on twitch uh, i probably am streaming right now go to twitch.tv slash bionic pig tv also follow me on Twitter. It's Bionic Pig YT. You just switch the letters around. No, it's not. It's not switching the letters around. What am I talking about? My brain is great. But yes. Bye.